Hello and welcome to GameSack. You guys asked for it, all the games on the PlayStation that run at 60 frames per second. Well, some of you asked for it, I probably just would have done it anyway. And games that ran at this speed were pretty uncommon back in the 32-bit era, and that's what makes all these games special. Now, for this episode, I only have two rules. Rule number one, no 2D games. And yes, I know the PlayStation does 2D games making, you know, sprites out of two different polygons. They don't count for this episode. Number one. Number two, it has to have 60 frames per second during the gameplay, so not during a cutscene somewhere. Anyway, I've got a lot to show you, so let's get started. First up is a game called One on One from Jorudan, which was only released in Japan. It's a one on one basketball game with crazy characters and less than intuitive control. The game runs not only in high resolution, but also at 60 frames per second, hence the inclusion in this episode. The cutaways slow down to 30 frames per second for dramatic effect, but otherwise this one is silky smooth. This is Agent Armstrong from King of the Jungle. This weird run and gun type of thing was only released in Japan and Europe. The controls are very odd, and I can't figure out what the game wants me to do to get out of the first area here. It's too bad because this game has potential. It moves really well, but it does need more work. Next is Battle Arena Toshinden 3 from Tamsoft. This one has a 60 frames per second mode right in the option screen. This reduces the graphical quality of the game though. In fact, it absolutely decimates the backgrounds. For example, here's the game running at 30 frames per second. And now, here's that same stage in the 60 frames per second mode. How would you choose to play this game? This one's called Block Kids. It's basically a breakout clone built out of polygons. This barely counts, but it does. Bloody Roar is a cool fighting game from Hudson Soft. It almost goes without saying that most 3D fighting games on the console will run at a high frame rate like this one does. The gameplay really depends on being able to see and react to what's going on as fast as possible. But I'm mentioning the fighting games anyway because they do count. In this one, you can change from a person to a beast to inflict more damage. Bloody Roar 2 continues the same smooth frame rate. However, this one increases the resolution and even adds 16x9 anamorphic widescreen as an option. This is not only a fun sequel, but a technically impressive one all around. Boxing from Agatech. Yeah, it's just called boxing. It uses anime style characters though, and moves as fast as the PlayStation can do it. It also runs in high resolution in released mode. It's decently fun, which kind of surprised me. Here's Contra Legacy of War from Konami. Konami farmed it out to Appalooza because they just couldn't be bothered. The only thing this game really has going for it is the crisp frame rate. It's buttery smooth. Sadly, it doesn't do much to make the game very enjoyable. Crime Killer from Interplay. This one boasts right on the case that it's 60 frames per second. In this 3D driving game, you need to make your way around the map and kill crime. Because killing isn't a crime if it's crime you're killing. I often find that it's tough to catch up to the crime on your map that needs killing. It looks great though. Critical Blow from Rackdime and Ban Presto. <laughs> Critical Blow. This is an okay polygonal fighting game that was only released in Japan. It looks good and it sounds good, but I just didn't find it very exciting. But the frame rate is great. Dance Dance Revolution 5th Mix from Konami. This was only released in Japan. This isn't really my type of game, but it's an upgrade over the fourth mix because your dancer and all of the effects move at a higher frame rate now. This can be a bit tough with the regular controller. You really want the power pad or whatever it is to use your feet. Here's Dead or Alive from Tecmo. This is a port of the arcade fighting game, but with new stages and silly new costumes. Like the Saturn port, this one runs at 60 frames per second and in high resolution. 
It's fast and responsive, just like it should be, and it has great music too. Supposedly creator Tomonobu Itigaki prefers the Saturn version, but this one certainly isn't bad at all. This is Devil Dice from THQ. In this puzzle game, you need to match the number on the die to the other dice to make them disappear. But if the number is three, for example, you need to connect three or more of them all at once or it won't work. There's even multiplayer modes for more chaos. It's definitely a clever idea for a puzzle game, but it sure isn't easy. But at least it's smooth and also in high resolution. Here's Doraemon Nobita 2 Fukatsu no Hoshi from Epoch. This side-scrolling game features levels built out of polygons, even bosses. Leaps of faith back and forth are a thing here. The first Dynasty Warriors game makes this list, and the first game in the series is a one-on-one -on -one 3D fighting game. It's weapons-based, not unlike Soul Calibur. It looks great, and it runs in high resolution. The music is also enjoyable. Overall, this one's pretty good. All right, 15 games down and many more to go. I wonder if this next one would have been more popular if it perhaps had a different name. Here's Air Guys from Square and Dream Factory. This is a 3D fighting game that's actually pretty fun. The ability to play as Cloud from Final Fantasy VII was a big thing back when this one came out. It also runs in high resolution. Since this is from Dream Factory, there's also a quest mode just like their other games, Tobal 1 and 2, which you'll see later. Even this mode runs at 60 frames per second. <laughs> Einhander from Square. This is a pretty cool early shooter that seems to take place mostly in the dark of night. You can grab weapons from defeated enemies, which is good because you don't have unlimited ammo here. At the time, I thought this one was weird because of the strange angles that the gameplay sometimes shifts to, but overall, this is a solid game with some occasionally great music. Here's Elemental Gear Bolt from Sony and Working Designs. There's some minor screen flashing during this game, so viewer beware. This is a light gun game, though you certainly don't need to use a light gun. It can also be pretty tough, but you can increase your powers a bit between levels. Naturally, the game is on rails, but the sweeping movement to and fro is all super smooth thanks to the uncommonly high frame rate. This one also has a great soundtrack. Make no mistake though, it's gonna kick your ass. Fatal Fury Wild Ambition from SNK. This is a home port of the 3D Fatal Fury arcade fighting game. It was one of the few games on the Hyper Neo Geo 64. As you can see, it looks pretty simple, and it is. You have 3D characters and a floor, but everything else is 2D. The game feels a bit laggy to control, but that's definitely not due to the crisp frame rate. It can't match other 3D fighters and definitely not the 2D Fatal Fury games, but it's worth trying if you're a fan of the series. This is Fighter's Impact from Taito. This was only released in Japan. This generically named 3D fighting game plays just as plainly as its name. I kind of like how it looks, and it sure moves smoothly, but the gameplay itself is really nothing special at all. I can see why nobody bothered to release it elsewhere. Here's Fighting Illusion K1 Grand Prix 98, 99, 2000, and 2001 from Xing. These four are all based on the K1 martial art, which looks a lot like kickboxing to me. You play as real kickboxer K1 martial artists. 98 was released in North America and Europe without the Fighting Illusion title in front and also amidst the year. 99, 2000, and 2001 look better and even run in high resolution mode. You might like them if you enjoy high frame rate technical boxing games. Next up is Final Fantasy Tactics from Square. This is an excellent strategy RPG with lots to offer. 
The stages are built with polygons, and since it's in this episode, they all move at not 58, not 59, but 60 frames per second. Well, 59.94 frames per second in NTSC, but hey, that's not the game's fault or the PlayStation's. What's interesting to me is that a game like this doesn't require a high frame rate at all, but they did it anyway. It adds that extra gloss that really makes it feel professional and high quality. If you like good games, which most people do, maybe give this one a try. This one's called Floating Runner, and it's from Xing. You have complete freedom of movement in this 3D platformer. The game takes a bit of getting used to as your weapon fires in an arc, which is kind of weird. Also, it can be tough to time your jumps. But through all of it, the game runs at a locked 60 frames per second, or at least I never noticed it dipping. Sometimes the environments have blocky textures, and sometimes they have that flat shaded look. This is an early game on the console, so go in knowing that. Forsaken from Acclaim and Pro. This is a weird flying first-person shooter thing with extremely difficult to master controls. Every button is needed simply to move around. You can use a DualShock, but honestly, I found it even tougher to control that way. But man, it sure is smooth, isn't it? Funky Boxers from Victor. This Japan-only 2002 release came very late in the console's life. It's a boxing game where the boxers are, get this, funky. It looks pretty good for the system. Go for his head! Forget the ribs! Here's G Darius or G Darius from Taito. I wanted to mention this shooter really quick, but I'm not sure that it truly counts. Yes, parts of the image are updated every 60th of a second, but in the form of screen tearing or lack of V-Sync. So the whole picture doesn't always update all at once. Sometimes it does, but to me, when a game does this, it doesn't count as a true 60 frames per second game. Anyway, just wanted to mention that. Gauntlet Legends from Midway falls into the same category. Like G Darius Darius, this one has a lot of screen tearing, so it's hard to count this one. However, at least part of the screen changes every 1 60th of a second. This is Gene Togi Shadow Struggle from Band Presto and Rackdime. This 3D fighting game is the predecessor to Critical Blow and was also only released in Japan. The same things can basically be said about this one. It's not very exciting, but the frame rate is nice. The game is also quite fast. <laughs> Here's Geom Cube from Technos. This is a 3D puzzle game like Blockout. It's very simple visually, but hey, everything here, including the introductions, are at 60 frames per second. This is Goiken Muyo 2 from KSS. This Japan only 3D fighting game is the follow up to Anarchy in the Nipple on the Saturn. This one is less silly though. Some stages have ring outs, but not all of them. Also, sometimes, but not every time, I can continue to damage an opponent and they won't die, despite having no life left in their life bar. That's weird. This one is a bit above average overall. It also runs in high resolution mode. Gran Turismo from Polyphony Digital. The first game in this series generally looks like this, running at around 30 frames per second with some screen tearing. However, if you beat all arcade races on difficult, you unlock the High res GT. Here, you race three similar looking tracks at night by yourself at 60 frames per second with some screen tearing. The resolution certainly didn't increase, so maybe Polyphony Digital doesn't know what the word means? Or maybe they meant that the temporal resolution has increased, which it absolutely has at a higher frame rate. Anyway, here you go, Gran Turismo at 60 frames per second. Here's the Brand Stream Saga, wait, no, the Grand Stream Saga from Sony and THQ. Nice font. This is an okayish RPG that lets you control the character directly in battle as opposed to menus. This is another game where they really didn't need to make it run at such a high frame rate, but they did anyway. Unfortunately, this results in the loss of a lot of detail. For example, the characters don't have faces at all. You can rotate the camera with the L1 and R1 buttons, and this seems to be the only time where it consistently drops frames. 
Check it out if it looks interesting to you. You remember that boxing game for the Mega Drive in Japan that was called Final Blow? It got its name change when it came out over here. I wonder if this next game would have gotten its name change if it left Japan, because it's called Hard Blow. <laughs> this boxing game from Electronic Arts was only released in Japan, and it looks like this. I find it interesting that there are no life or stamina meters on the screen at all. I won my first match, but I couldn't figure out how to proceed to the next one. I think I'm okay with that. Hyper Final Match Tennis from Human. This tennis game is a follow-up to the PC Engine game with a similar name. I can't time the controls on this one to save my life. The graphics are minimal. Next! This is IQ Intelligent Cube from Sony. You gotta be smart to play this one. It's a puzzle game where you need to press a button in order to change the color of the floor tile. Then, when a cube rolls on it, press the button again to capture the cube. You need to capture all the cubes without being pushed off the edge. Honestly, it's a bit boring, especially with the first several levels, but I've always loved the symphonic music used in this one. There's not a whole lot happening on screen, so it's no surprise that it can move at a great frame rate. Invasion from Beyond by King of the Jungle. I have no idea how to play this free roaming 3D game and it's not clear what it wants me to do. I get that you need to suck up the earthlings I guess, but pretty much anything else I do results in this guy being ashamed and nodding his head. The gameplay doesn't matter for this episode though. The game is super smooth even though the draw distance is less than optimal. Quit nodding your head at me you, you guy. And here's IS Internal Section from Square. This game, which was only ever released in Japan, makes me think of what Tempest might be like if it had a constantly moving adventure mode with a little bit of res tossed in for good measure. It's a fairly simple game to play. You have four phases to play through and then you have a boss fight. During these, you can move in and out as well as around. It's one hit and you're dead and you're set back to the beginning of the phase. You also have a stock of bombs which can destroy or damage everything in the tunnel. This one's really smooth and really fun. I think this game would greatly benefit from an HD or 4K remaster, making those lines and shapes a lot cleaner. Well, maybe give it 120 frames per second, because why not? I think it would be popular. Common Rider from Bandai. There are five of these games on the platform and they're 3D fighting games that run at 60 frames per second. I'm not gonna show all of them individually, but they're each similar enough to this first one here. I chose to play as this bug guy. It's a bit generic looking, but the gameplay isn't bad. This is Kensei Sacred Fist from Konami. That's right, your fist is sacred in this 3D fighting game. It runs in interlaced mode and even has some 3D elements to the background. There are a lot of characters to unlock, so be sure to play the game to the end with each. I enjoy this one. Kickboxing from Agatech. Yeah, just kickboxing. This is the follow-up to the game that was just called Boxing, only I found this one less enjoyable. It does have more modes to play through, though. Here we have Klonoa from Namco. This is an excellent 2.5D platformer and honestly one of the best such games ever made. Namco didn't take any shortcuts with this one either. They made sure it's always super smooth and responsive. As a player, I definitely appreciate that as I'm grabbing onto things, pushing my way into new areas. Or maybe I'm using the things that I grab to defeat enemies. It doesn't matter because it's loads of fun and the game is as smooth as glass no matter what I'm doing.
Here's Kula Quest, also known as Kula World in Europe. In this puzzle game, you need to guide a beach ball around a 3D structure to collect keys and unlock the goal and then make your way to the goal. You can also collect other things along the way which may or may not help you. You can jump or even go onto the sides of the structure which defies gravity, but you can only change sides at certain places. This requires you to really think about how to navigate around any given stage. Supposedly, this one had a US release, but I could only find images for the European and Japanese releases. Naturally, I went with the Japanese release because it's 10 frames per second faster. Lattice 200 EC7 from No Sight. This was only released in Japan. I'm not exactly sure how to describe this game, so just look at it as I play. I'm not sure what I'm really doing, so that probably isn't going to help you much. It sure moves fast, though. Micro Machines V3 from Midway and Codemasters. This overhead racing game starts out really fun as you try to race around cool environments. During the third race, the game takes a nosedive as the camera starts swinging around and that makes it very difficult to control. This really could have been great, but instead it isn't. Mortal Kombat 4 from Midway. Like the Nintendo 64 version, this one also runs at 60 frames per second. This one looks a little sharper though. Each time I play this game, my fondness of it grows a little more. It's just fun, man. Somehow I get the feeling that it wasn't appreciated very much in its own time. Motortune Grand Prix from Polyphony Digital. This is actually called Motortune Grand Prix 2 in Japan, and it does not run at 60 frames per second. However, the hidden mini game called Tank Combat does. Here, you just roam around trying to find and shoot your enemy. Unlike Gran Turismo, this one actually is in a higher resolution than the main game. Polyphony Digital sure likes these hidden high frame rate modes. This is Motorhead from Fox and Gremlin. This is a racing game set in the future. As a result, it's always very dark and dystopian. You can definitely tell that it was made by Europeans because they absolutely love that. The 60 frames per second mode here is limited to two AI cars. The music isn't bad, but it's certainly not from Motorhead like you'd expect it to be. There is one thing that's remarkable about this one though. It takes place in a dystopian future and there's no weapons. I didn't even know that was possible. It's amazing how many games on the console ran at 60 frames per second, many of which I've never even heard of, like this next one. Next is N2O, Nitrous Oxide from Fox and Gremlin. With a name like that, you'd think this would be another racing game, but nope. It's more like IS internal section from several minutes ago, only more trippy and also more difficult. Your job is to try to destroy all of the bugs. They keep coming until you kill them all. Then it's on to the next level. The graphics are excellent, though I'm betting I might get a little motion sick if I played this for a while. The music is also excellent, but licensed, so I've got to be careful with this segment. Overall, I think I'd rather play IS Internal Section. Here's Night Raid from Takumi. This Japan-only vertical shooter is absolutely insane. There are tons of enemy projectiles on screen at once, especially in the later stages. If that doesn't stress you out, the crazy backgrounds will. Everything in this game purposely works to distract you. There's so much going on here, I just hope that YouTube's compression can keep up with it without resorting to it looking all blocky. I love the voice when I get a power up. Also, the music here rocks. This is Philosoma from Sony themselves. It's a horizontal shooter. No wait, it's a vertical shooter. 
No, wait, it's a Space Harrier style shooter. No, wait, it's a Crash Bandicoot running away from the Boulder style shooter. Unfortunately, it tries to be everything and it does none of these things very well. The backgrounds are all made up of high frame rate polygons with the exception of the horizontal segments. This came out fairly early in the console's life and I never hear anyone mention it anymore. Honestly, not surprising. Pong, the next level from Atari. It's Pong, slightly reimagined. Someone actually thought the world needed this. I have nothing more to say. How about Power Serve 3D Tennis? This was a launch game for the console. It's not a good game of tennis, not at all. But hey, it has a perfect frame rate, so it's got that going for it. This is Project Horned Owl. This one has some more minor screen flashing, just FYI. It's another light gun game brought to you by the same people who made Elemental Gear Bolt. Sony localized this one themselves though. Like Elemental Gear Bolt, this one moves around quite smoothly. As a game, it plays a little nicer since the difficulty isn't cranked up to a billion on this one. Unfortunately, it does seem a bit more generic and less stylized than Elemental Gear Bolt. It also feels like there's a lot less detail and color in the visuals. Still, this one is definitely worth trying out as most people haven't even heard of it. No room to maneuver in this place. Let's get out of here. Here's R-Type Delta from IREM. This is another challenging entry into the series. However, here it's presented with chunky polygonal graphics for the first time. Despite this, it can still look pretty good at times and it's almost always at 60 frames per second outside of a bit of slowdown here and there. You'll keep dying and you'll keep trying, which is what I love about this series. You even have a super weapon that you can use once your little thingy absorbs enough energy or shots from the enemies. Nice colors and music really help things out here. Rascal from Traveler's Tales. This 3D platformer mostly runs at 60 frames per second, but it drops a lot. This game would be decent if someone went in and redesigned the camera and especially the controls. I've heard that Cygnosis demanded that the game be changed from normal directional controls to tank controls. That move there ruined what could have been. There is a ton of potential here, but as it is, it's not worth playing here in the future. This is Raystorm from Taito and Working Designs. This is the sequel to the excellent overhead vertical shooter known as Galactic Attack on the Saturn, but here everything is made of polygons. No matter, as it still moves at the same 60 frames per second of the original game most of the time. You have a normal shot which fires basically straight ahead and is pretty much useless, as well as a lock on target which works similar to Panzer Dragoon. I prefer the original game, but this one is pretty cool. The sequel, called Ray Crisis, also makes this list. This one feels a bit faster and more action-packed compared to Ray Storm. It still manages to keep a fairly solid frame rate though, and for this episode, that's what matters. It's a good game in its own right and definitely worth trying if you enjoyed Ray Storm. Go down to the video store and rent it today. This one's called RC Day Go and it's another Taito game. In this one, you're controlling radio-controlled cars either with tank controls or if you use the DualShock controller like a real RC car with twin sticks. I tell you, this game has no business being this fun, but it is. Everything looks great for the system, and the music and the energy level really raised this title up in my book. The camera is a little jittery, yeah, but hey, it's still 60 frames per second. This one almost doesn't qualify as there is some screen tearing. It's way through the rain. Just keep on the same way. A pool of water! And then there's RC Helicopter from D3. Sadly, this is nowhere near as fun as RC Day Go. It's very twitchy, just like a real RC helicopter. As such, it can kind of be frustrating to control until you get the hang of it. But hey, at least here you can mow the lawn. The Ridge Racer Turbo Mode bonus disc was included with Ridge Racer Type 4 from Namco. 
This is an update to the launch game Ridge Racer to enable 60 frames per second and interlacing using all of the things that they've learned since they made the original. This is definitely a cool bonus. Unfortunately, only one other car is on the track with you now. Also, I'm not sure why they bothered enabling interlacing. Nothing here is presented in a higher resolution than it originally was, so the screen jitters just for the hell of it without any benefit. Oh well, this is still a fantastic update, and the regular full game is on the same disc as well. Yeah! It's a new record! This is Rival Schools from Capcom. Capcom made a lot of fighting games, and, well, this is one of them. This is the first time I've played it, and it's okay, I suppose. The visuals kind of remind me of Final Fight Revenge. Capcom felt the game needed to be divided up into two discs for some reason, Arcade and Evolution. The presentation on both is the same. <laughs> Running Wild from 989 Studios. This is a racing game where anthropomorphized animals run around laps. It's an interesting concept that reminds me of Sonic R. This one actually plays a little bit better than Sonic R. Unlike that one though, this one makes me a little motion sick after a while, probably due to the floaty camera. You're motor. Yeah! All right, we're just about done. Only one more segment of games to go. I want to thank you guys for hanging out even this long because, hell, I would have bailed by now. Actually, no, I wouldn't because this is a subject that interests me, so thank you for sharing my interests. Anyway, let's finish this up. Shake Kids from Digital Kids and On Demand was only released in Japan. This is a bizarre action game where you have a pre-rendered character who goes around defeating enemies. He or she must also figure out how to get past obstacles in the stage as well. Shiritsu Justice Gakuen Niketsu Shaishun Niki 2, Christ, from Capcom. This Japan only title is basically the follow up to Rival Schools. Be careful what mode you'll pick, otherwise, you'll end up in this text driven type of gameplay. The game certainly has its moments, and it's not bad. Skeleton Warriors from Neversoft. Like the Saturn version, this one uses platforms and floors that are made out of polygons. Also like the Saturn version, the 3D stages don't move at 60 frames per second. I prefer the Saturn game mainly because of the controller. Slamscape from Viacom. You're a death sled looking for hidden orbs while the rest of the world tries to bother you. The frame rate is the game's best asset. The music is from God Lives Underwater if you've ever heard of them. Gonna have to say, I don't recommend this one. Next is Slap Happy Rhythm Busters. Yeah, Slap Happy Rhythm Busters. Anyway, it's from Ask and only released in Japan. This cell shaded fighting game was one of the first games with this style. It also has rhythm game overtones here and there. The visuals kind of remind me of Jet Set Radio, which came out around the same time. The unnecessary interlacing is distracting, even on a CRT. But hey, it moves at 60 frames per second, and the characters are polygons, so here it is. Starfighter Sandvein from Success. You go into small rooms and clear all the enemies out. Then you select a new room and clear that. Sometimes you need to defeat a boss. It drops frames occasionally. They sure made a lot of strange games on the PlayStation. Here's Street Fighter EX plus Alpha. They decided that Street Fighter needed to be in 3D, so here we go. I never hear anyone talk about this series these days. While it does have the moves of the regular Street Fighter games, it also has its own unique moves and stuff you can do. As a Street Fighter game, it's a touch disappointing. As a regular 3D fighting game, it's not too bad, and it is worth trying. Could have used more alpha, I think. Somehow, that got a sequel as Street Fighter EX2+. Plus what? Plus nothing. 
Just EX2+. This one's actually better than the first. The fighting seems much more responsive and the pace seems a bit quicker, the constant loading screens notwithstanding. The music is also more energetic and appropriate. This is a good 3D fighting game if I do say so myself. As a Street Fighter game, it's still below average, but hey, what are you gonna do? This is Street Racer from Ubisoft. This is a kart racing game, and at first glance, it looks incredible for its time. Everything is so bright, sharp, and smooth. But the tracks are all extremely short. So short that this almost doesn't feel like a real game. The tracks are built differently than the Saturn version. Yeah, you could do worse, I suppose. Striker World Cup Premier Stage from Rage Software. This is similar to Rage Software's soccer game on the Saturn. It moves incredibly fast and it looks smooth, but there are many better soccer games that you could play if you wanted to actually have fun. Check it out, it's Tekken from Namco. This game impressed me back when I first saw it on the PlayStation, specifically because of its 60 frames per second movement. Compared to the 30 frames per second or so that I was used to on the Saturn Virtua Fighter, it looked really smooth. I've never felt that the gameplay was quite as good as Virtua Fighter, but it's not bad. Each button controls a different limb, so that's probably exciting for some people. I always felt that the ground looked too pixelated on this one, though. Tekken 2 came out the next year. It retains the super smooth movement, and now the ground looks a ton better. Even the characters look a touch better. Overall, not a bad upgrade over the first game. In fact, I'd recommend this one over the first any day. Then came Tekken 3. They really improved the graphic quality of everything on this one. Now you have walls or whatnot which surround each area of play for some added visual flair. There's also some occasional lighting effects. Next, it runs in high resolution. Yes, it interlaces, but not pointlessly so like a lot of games do. As you can see, the 60 frames per second gameplay is maintained. You even get the same fluid motion for the new Tekken Force original mode. You really can't go wrong with this one unless you absolutely hate Tekken. Here's Tempest X3, even though it just says Tempest X. This is basically the PlayStation version of Tempest 2000. It's 3D-ish, and hey, it's moving at 60 frames per second. As a result, it's included here today. We can't forget Thunder Force 5 from Technosoft and localized by working designs. This horizontal shooter is a port of the Saturn game. Overall, it's a tiny step down from that one, but still quite good and still maintains the high frame rate outside of the very, very minor slowdown here and there. In fact, it has much less slowdown than the Saturn version. The Saturn version had so much slowdown that I couldn't include it in the Saturn 60 frames per second episode. This isn't the best Thunder Force game, but it sure is hell a great one. This is Tobal number one from Square. This is a one-on-one -on -one 3D fighting game that runs in high resolution and looks super clean and crisp. As you can see, it also moves very fluidly, which is always needed for a fighting game. This game is actually more fun than you'd think, and you wouldn't really think Square would be so good at making a fighting game. The quest mode also runs in the same high resolution and frame rate. Overall, this is a fantastic package. <laughs> Then there's Tobal 2, which sadly stayed in Japan. This is another fighting game as you'd expect, and it's even better than the first on a technical level. The game itself is just as good, if not better. The backgrounds now have some texture mapping applied, and the frame rate didn't take a hit at all. Once again, the quest mode also has the same qualities, though it's different as far as gameplay goes. Again, it's too bad that this one didn't get released outside of Japan, but it's been translated by fans so you can fully enjoy it. Fight! Next is Tomba from Whoopi Camp. Yeah, Tomba himself is a sprite and so are a lot of the enemies, but much of the world is built out of 3D polygons. This is a great game, and the smooth frame rate certainly helps anyone who plays it enjoy it even more. Be sure to try it if you've never played it. Unfortunately, the second game doesn't live up to these same standards.
Here's Turbo Prop Racing, also known as Rapid Racer. This one's a bit frustrating because it's easy to make your boat turn around the wrong way. The track designs are cool and they move great, but I feel that I probably would get a little bit of motion sickness if I played this one for too much longer. Make no mistake, this is no Hydro Thunder. Umihara Kawase Shun from Xing. This Japan only game is a cool platformer where you basically use a fishing line to get around and you need to figure out the best and fastest way to make it to the exit. Believe it or not, a large portion of the stages are built out of polygons, but you might need to look close. And, well, they move at 60 frames per second when they do move. Umihara Kawase Shun's second edition came out three years later. Same deal here. Victory Boxing from Victor. This is a boxing game. There's really not much more to say than that, other than that it only came out in Japan. Virtual Hyru no Ken from Culture Brain. This is a Japan only 3D fighting game. Like most games from Culture Brain, this one is unrefined and not very fun to play. I know that's probably gonna make some of you mad, but honestly, I'm surprised it runs at such a good frame rate. Versus from Polygon Magic. This is another mediocre 3D fighting game exclusive to Japan. The PlayStation sure has a lot of these, doesn't it? Xevious 3D slash G Plus from Namco. What a great name. This has a bunch of different versions of their Xevious game, but it's the 3D slash G one that we're looking at here. It's a vertical shooter that's kind of like a less interesting Ray Storm. You can shoot enemies in the air as well as on the ground, but here you don't have any lock-on weapons. But the entire game moves very smoothly, so that's good. And some of the music isn't half bad either. Here's Zen Nihon Pro Wrestling, Uja no Tamashi from Human. As you can probably guess, this one was only released in Japan. Longtime viewers will know that I'm no good at wrestling games. But hey, I thought you'd like to know and see that this one runs at 60 frames per second. Finally, we have Zero Divide 2 from Zoom. Like the Saturn episode, we end things with a Zero Divide game. This 3D fighting game wasn't released in North America. It should have been though, it was released everywhere else. This is a really fun game that's better than its predecessor on the system. I love how you can knock the armor off of your opponents and it feels good when you do. Naturally, they do the same to you. I also like how you can hold onto the ring to avoid getting a ring out. Check this one out if you can, it's a good time. And there you go, games that run at 60 frames per second on the original PlayStation. Did I miss any? I'm gonna guess probably yes, just because of the sheer number of titles available for the platform. And like last time, I'm probably gonna get a lot of comments about games that people think run at 60 frames per second, but actually don't. So if you do have a legit example of one that does run at 60 frames per second, please, please let me know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Hey friends, has this ever happened to you? Hey man, you wanna play some video games? Hell yeah, I love playing video games. That's fantastic, let me grab one for us to play. I'm sick and tired of your woke agenda, you communist bastard. If this happens on the rig, be sure to check out my video about how to organize your game collection without forcing your so-called values on everybody else.
And be sure to check out my videos about anti-woke controller storage and also how to clean your consoles while still honoring our founding fathers. Hey man, you wanna play some video games? Hell yeah, I love playing video games. That's fantastic, let me grab one for us to play. I'm sick and tired of your fascist agenda, you alt-right bastard. I think maybe I watched too many of that guy's videos.